Welcome. This is uh, Dance for Health Interventions During a Global Pandemic and Beyond. And I'm your moderator. My name is Ellie Kushner. I'm hoping all of this is live because I'm still getting the busy signal from my computer. <laughs> there, it says it's live. Um, so again, um, welcome to Dance for Health Interventions During a Global Pandemic and Beyond. I'm your moderator for this conversation, Ellie Kushner. Um, I'm the chair of the I Adams Dance Educators Committee, and I'm a Pilates teacher and a dance teacher in New York City, and I'm also the host of Danceville Podcast. And I'll introduce our guests in a moment. First, I just want to tell you a little bit about IADAMS. If you're not familiar with IADAMS, that stands for the International Association of Dance Medicine and Science. And we are a professional organization that enhances health, well-being, training, and performance in dance by cultivating medical, scientific, and educational excellence. And this um, Facebook group that you're watching through is from the um, Dance Educators Committee. So we're a committee within IADAMS that really um, aims to support you as educators and also hear from you as educators so that we can make sure that your experiences are, um, are contributing to the design of the work that we do. And for this event, we're hosting members of the Dance for Health Committee. So all three of these great members are members of the Dance for Health Committee and they can sort of unfold what that means in a moment once we get into our conversation, but I wanna start by introducing them. So I'm gonna start with um, Claire Gus West, MA, is the chair of the I Adams Dance for Health Committee and a specialist in dance, health, and aging who runs repertoire-based programs for senior well-being in theater and care home environments. Hi, Claire. Hi, hi. Calling from Switzerland, right? Yes, from Zurich. And then Emily Jenkins, MA, is a dance artist and a producer working in participatory dance. She's also specialized in the area of dance and health and is founder of a project for women living with and beyond cancer called Move Dance Feel. Hi, Emily. Hello. Are you in France? Is that right? No, I'm in the Netherlands. So Netherlands. Um, David Leventhal is a dance artist and educator, as well as founding teacher and program director of Dance for PD at the Mark Morris Dance Group in Brooklyn. Hi, uh, but he's actually not in Brooklyn. That is not what Brooklyn is like. That's <laughs> outside of Brooklyn. <laughs> I'm a little outside of Brooklyn. And then, um, not on the panel, but, but joining us in the audience available to sort of take questions and supply some resources there as we go along is Usa Ustrom, who is a choreographer, dancer, and teacher based in Sweden, where she leads sessions for dance for Parkinson's, dance for stroke, cultural integration, seniors, and community dance. So welcome to all of you, and thank you so much for doing this. Thank you as for having us. Thank you. Um, as we go through, you are welcome to use the comments section to contribute um, comments and questions that you would like me to feed to the panelists. And this will also be recorded. So if you're having a hard time or you have to step away, this will be recorded and shared on YouTube. And then the last detail I have to share is just that Emily does have a, a hard stop after an hour. So if she disappears gracefully, um, it's, it's not because we've lost her on the line or that she has uh, disappeared into the ethos. She, she has somewhere she needs to be. So I just wanna um, let you know that ahead of time. So uh, the first question I want to posit to all of you, we'll just go around to each of you, starting with Claire, um, is just could you start by letting our audience know who you teach and in what context, and then maybe give people a little more information by talking about the major challenges of confinement for your respective populations. So if you could paint us a picture of sort of like what life is like right now for your students. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, I won't take too long because uh, there's, there's lots of interesting things to hear from my colleagues as well. But I teach um, two different groups. Uh, I mean, two different public uh, sectors of the public. One is autonomous seniors. So autonomous seniors, meaning that they can actually walk to the theatre or get to the theatre. 
and they are up to age 92, I think is our eldest there in those groups. And then also we have mobile teams going out to care homes, so residential care homes. So that's a very different um, teaching and a very different environment. So those, those two. And um, during this uh, enforced confinement period, most of our focus has been on the the autonomous seniors who suddenly find themselves confined, of course. Um, the biggest challenges for them, and you're going to hear this multiple times, are actually the isolation and the lack of contact. Um, so the, the dance classes themselves are much less about the physical activity that they might be when you're younger and much more about actually being seen and being heard and, and connecting with other people. So that's the biggest lack that they are experiencing. Uh, of course, many others in terms of a reduction of, of fitness levels just from not having a, a big enough a circle of, um, uh, you know, I mean, circle of uh, ability to get out and to exercise and actually to take risks, to take uh, spatial risks. So. Um, there's quite a deterioration, I would imagine, but by the time I get to see them live in terms of reaction time, and I'm just speaking physically now, but I think the biggest difficulty for them is the, is the contact. Um, we haven't gone into the care homes, uh, and we haven't gone into the care homes virtually. Um, they've got animators there and are still able to do some activity, but we haven't, um, I haven't broached virtual with the care home. So we're working with the autonomous at home senior groups. Is that enough just as a starter, Ellie? Yeah, that's great. Is the limitation for the care homes just because of the risk factor, the exposure risk factor? Is that um, well, actually, no, it's, it, would have, it would have been totally possible to do um, our virtual with the care homes, but the mobile teams had only just started. So the, uh, this is something that's also going to come up with my colleagues. I know that one of the reasons that the virtual has been possible with the seniors is the fact that we already have a very well established relationship. So having a, relation, a real relationship uh, with one another, you're able somehow to get through this virtual period. So we had much less of a relationship developed with our mobile teaching teams. That's the only, so really circumstantial that we hadn't really got that developed enough to then just be able to give them uh, virtual materials to be following with their animateurs. But we, we chose to do our research. So we've got research through Bern University around seniors use of virtual. Um, or their comfort and using virtual technology. Um, and that's, we focused on the autonomous seniors, most of whom are at home alone. Great, and we'll be talking more about um, some of those comforts with technology, among many other things, the isolation that you referred to. Um, Emily, do you wanna tell us a bit about what you're doing? Yeah, sorry, just unmuting myself. Um, so although I'm dialing in from the Netherlands, I am a British dance artist and I work um, in lots of different community and health settings in the UK primarily. But as you introduced, I'm specifically talking to you about Move Dance Feel. So I'm director of um, a company that offers dance to women affected by cancer. It was initiated in 2016 uh, to respond really to recognize need for post-treatment support um, and now works in partnership with cancer support centers across London and Bristol mainly. Um, so prior to the COVID-19 lockdown, we were engaging with women through weekly dance sessions and weekend courses. Um, but before the government declared lockdown, the cancer support centres in which the project has situated were closed. Um, so kind of all those support systems just kind of stopped overnight. Um, so when lockdown was declared, I think almost two and a half million people in the UK received text messages from the government instructed to shield. Um, and that's essentially like the hundreds of thousands of people affected by cancer are within that percentage because when you have cancer or you're battling the kind of side effects of treatment your ability to fight infection is lower lots of people use the word immunocompromised so if they were to have had a covid infection the chances of having complications or dying from that were much much higher they're deemed the high risk population 
So at the moment, those 12 weeks of shielding are kind of coming or have just come to an end, but it's still a very murky area as to who needs to continue shielding. And with the women I dance with, that's a lot of them. And in terms of the challenges they're currently facing, I mean, they're unable to leave their house, a lot of them. Um, for the last three months, they've had no social contact um, unless it's been online. Lots of them have been very dependent on neighbors or friends actually bringing food for them to the house. Um, they have very limited physical or creative stimulation. Uh, and, and I think on top of all of that, there's huge levels of anxiety and stress and fear. I mean, a lot of them are dependent on checkups, um, regular checkups for treatment or waiting for potentially life-saving operations that have just been put on hold. You know, the levels of fear and anxiety are incredibly high, although now restrictions are somewhat easing and some of them are really desperate to get out. It's not necessarily getting themselves it's not, you know, getting themselves to the hospital is, is coming up with all complications about being exposed to people on public transport. So, um, yeah, it's still a very murky time when they are um, very reliant on, on the online sessions at the moment, which we can talk about in due course. Well, that was a very vivid picture, Emily. I feel uh, you've brought a a lot of things up in terms of the vulnerability of the populations that you all teach and that's part of the reason we're having this panel while a lot of studios are reopening that will not necessarily be the case for the populations you all work with so that's part of why we're doing this panel now and it's still relevant at this time while it might not be for other populations so we'll, we'll talk about that in more detail um david tell us about dance for pd Hi everybody. First, it's really great to be to be with you and these wonderful colleagues to talk about this important issue. So thanks for the opportunity to do that. I think um, so I've been leading classes for people living with Parkinson's for 19 years, almost 19 years. Uh, our program is based at the Mark Morris Dance Group in Brooklyn, New York, and was really founded on the value and benefit of dance as a physical activity, but also dance as a social, expressive and cognitive activity that takes place in a studio together. So that community aspect, the community building aspect, which is so critical for a population that often feels cut off, excluded, uh, ostracized from, from dance and from other activities um, is, is fundamental to what we do. So when we switched to an online platform in March, we were really wondering how all of that would translate we became aware of really four uh, elements, which have all been said already here. So this is just reiterating. Um, and then a fifth one has become clear in the last week and a half. So the first is when you're, when you're sheltered in place at home, it's really difficult to find outlets to, to, to move, ways to move in that, in that setting. And for our population movement, is it's not a kind of optional or voluntary activity. It is, it is part of maintaining quality of life and maintaining well-being through the course of Parkinson's, which can be a very long-term chronic condition, 10, 15, 20, 25 years. Um, over the last 15 years, we've seen a lot of research indicating that uh, a movement practice, whether that's dance or Tai Chi or boxing, uh, is as important as the medication uh, uh, regimen that people are, are taking. So exercise and, and medication are, are equals. Uh, fine taking medication when you're sheltered at home, much more difficult to move. So we realize that maintaining some programming online and providing those opportunities were critical um, for our constituents. Um, fighting against that, of course, is apathy, which is a clinical manifestation of, of Parkinson's, that sense of really not wanting to do anything, not wanting to move, not wanting to participate. And I think the online platform has worked both ways. And in some ways, it, you can still have apathy. It's there. It doesn't mean you're going to use it. On the other hand, you don't have to get out of the house, get on a bus, go across town, go up three flights to a studio, deal with all of that stress. So it is right there for you. So I think in general, we've seen people really benefiting from the online experience as a um, as a, an antidote perhaps to to some of the apathy that they have going through their heads when they're looking to go to a, to a live class. Um, isolation, of course, is huge. And we know also from some of the research, the detrimental effects of loneliness, um, of isolation, 
uh, lack of social engagement. And so we, the Zoom classes are not just about the dance experience, but a 20 to 30 minute breakout session at the end where people can actually talk to each other and meet in smaller groups and connect uh, socially. Anxiety is huge. So anxiety is also a clinical manifestation of Parkinson's. And we've seen uh, anxiety rates rise dramatically through, um, through the, the spread of coronavirus. And um, so that was something that we wanted to address, again, by trying to maintain some kind of normalcy. And you're seeing the teachers you know, we're able to dance together, we're using music that you know, as much uh, as we can, providing a familiar experience for people um, and, and, and really emphasizing that as a, as a goal. I think the fifth piece of this is about what I would call a voice. And right now, as we see millions of people around the US taking to the streets to protest for equity and justice, um, we are seeing a lot of people who would like to be in those protests trapped at home. They are having to weigh their, um, their political uh, voice with safety, with actually being um, maintaining their health and as much as they want to be out on the streets protesting they are not comfortable being out there because of because of the novel coronavirus and so uh, we have included protest songs protest dances ways for people to speak up and stand up in solidarity with the black community through our classes um, and that has been a new development for us we didn't know uh, when we started these online classes that that would be an important element but it does feed into that sense of dance providing people a source of expression, right? And allowing them to say something through their bodies and to, to be part of a community that is speaking up. So that's been a, a new development and a, and a very welcome one, I think. Wow, that really gets at the scope of what we do in dance and what you're offering these populations. Um, yeah, from that social component to the movement as medicine and all the way into this idea of um, like civic engagement through dance. And so that's just incredible. Um, I wanna let you know that people are, are responding here in the chat. We, people from Brazil, Malaysia, uh, US, our, our neighbors in New York City, David, uh, UK, Canada, so thank you all for listening. And um, if you have questions or ideas, things you want to share, please use the comment section. Um, we look forward to hearing that, um, hearing those from you. So um, let's delve in a little bit deeper um, into the idea of how you've had to adapt the work that you traditionally do. And um, you know, this is something that is applicable to people all across the dance spectrum who teach all different populations. I was saying, you know, I suppose you could just teach in the same way on Zoom, but I don't think it works very well. You really have to make changes and that has some, come up over and over again on our panels. So um, how have each of you experienced those changes either um, I mean, you already started to get at some of the structural changes you made to class, like allowing these breakout groups at the end for socializing and stuff. Um, how else have you modified your classes during this time? Anybody want to start? You want me to go? Sure. Okay, I'll, I'll be brief as usual. So yeah, the, the, um, as David already mentioned, so that social element, we have to then factor in, it, it's always factored into a Dance for Health class, the ability to leave people the, the opportunity to, to um, communicate and interact with each other. So that's part of your class planning, if we can call it like that. But online, uh, moderating that or facilitating that has obviously become a, an, a really important element. So that's, that's a given. Um, I think for me, the biggest challenge is I've worked in two different ways with the seniors during this since March in this period of time, because it was also part of the research program. So we've um, worked with recorded material, which they downloaded. And we've also worked in live Zoom um, and they have different, um, again, we'll talk technologically later, but they've got different pluses and minuses, pros and cons for the seniors. Um, so the strangest is working in recorded because of course there's physical activity and of course there's a kind of 
uh, traditional command style learning phrases, so it has a teaching style, but that's a very small component really of what we're doing for the general overall health of the senior population. So in order to promote um, kind of synaptic health, and um, David will know a lot more or have to dig much deeper into this than, than I do, but nevertheless, we do work on um, brain hardware and health within our, the structure of our classes. You need a lot of improvisation and provoking reaction time and what's called executive choice. So really trying to get the um, seniors, I don't like that term, I'm so sorry, the dancers to be um, responsive. So that was quite interesting in a recorded session because I would actually have to do a kind of call and response as you might do in a jazz session and keep totally still whilst I allowed them the possibility to kind of respond to something I'd done without the ability to see them at all. Um, and so that, uh, I think I, I've mentioned it before talking uh, in other groups, but I find myself totally overacting. So using 150% too much energy in order to do that, just to try to get through the screen and provoke or promote um, a response to that. So um, that's been the, the, the strangest, the, the create, managing to keep the creativity and the response in a recorded instance. And I've relied a lot, as David mentioned, on being able to deliver some familiar elements. So some new, but some, some things that they could actually have a aha or feel comfortable with because they were familiar with musics or with formats or with, with shapes. Um, so that's, that's one of the newest uh, for me is trying to get that um, interaction whilst actually in a fixed um, recorded format um, but there are other advantages to the recorded format which we can discuss later if you're interested that's enough from me i might just pick up or follow on from uh claire's point she uses the word overacting whereas me i think it's just about bringing in all that energy and uh one of the biggest structural changes i've made is that um i'm delivering 45 minute sessions whereas live sessions in the space would be two hours so as as a facilitator i think you would normally build up those levels of excitement or increase of pace and increase in energy. Whereas in a shorter session, you just got to kind of hit the ground running and really try and transfer that through the screen for what actually is a very short amount of time, 40, 45 minutes online goes incredibly quickly. Um, and then one of my biggest questions when we started in terms of content, you know, my practice is very centered around connection, um, kind of using dance to help people connect to the body, connect to themselves, but also that exchange, that connection with others. I'm thinking if we do have to take a slightly more directive approach, you know, how can we facilitate connection that's not too time consuming and that works through ideas that translate when we don't have a whole studio space to play with. And I think, you know, just practically that means not always having mute throughout the session. You know, you have moments where you unmute and you check in with people. Um, having moments that are perhaps small, but are improvised in response to one another, even though I might be very much painting a framework around, okay, this is what we're playing with and this is how we're doing it. Then we're going to have two minutes to improvise with these ideas, but acknowledge those on the screen with you and who you're dancing with. Um, for sure, there's moments where you might get lost in your space and dance with your environment and dance with your room, but know that you are having this experience live with others right now, which is one of the reasons I very much use Zoom and use live sessions interactive as opposed to kind of pre-recording something and putting it out there for anyone to engage with at any time. And then structurally, again, for me, content wise, you know, in a two hour session, although it's very much focused around the art form, there's very important moments of social connection, uh, whether that's a break, whether that's coming into the space, getting ready for the session or having conversations afterwards, those social moments are key to the whole experience of, of dance and dance for health and building relationships with people. So I'm offering a 45 minute dance session and then a 15 minute break and then for those that want more of a discussion, uh, we come back online for another 45 minutes to have a brief check in, you know, how are you doing? Any questions? Or oh, I've got this letter of shielding, what do I do? Um, or have you seen this other piece online that you're watching or this resource, etc. But then I'm steering conversation as to talking about dance films, you know, we're spoiled at the moment for the array of dance films, high quality contemporary dance pieces that are coming online. So we've kind of started a 
a book club but for dance and each Monday I will send out a recommend a suggestion and then on Friday those that want to join us online and discuss it do and it's a nice way of managing you know some of the stresses and, and fears that people are bringing up they have a place to voice that but then the conversation gets steered into something creative and we become dance critics and I think for those who perhaps never really went to the theatre due to geographical restrictions or financial restrictions are now having world-class performances um, at home and a space to talk about it, therefore deepening their connection, I think, to the entire dance ecology and cultural sector. The, those are so beautiful, relevant things for everyone. I love that idea of the dance video book club. I mean, these are the things that can live on after this strange time that we're in. Um, can I add something first? Yeah, like there's okay. some times where, depending on the film, it might then um, help me springboard into some of the ideas we're offering in the movement session. So they can relate how they're moving in the session to um, potentially a performance idea that they've also seen in film. So it's helping me generate further ideas for content. Yeah, Claire. Yeah, so just, sorry, David, I'm sure you've got burning stuff to say here. Um, I just wanted to add that for the research purposes of the recorded material, um, I actually, cr we created those for them in what I'd call like sound bites of 20 minutes of tasks or material and um, with different objectives. So I don't just mean dance objectives, but different health objectives. Um, so some of them uh, would be calming some of them would be uh, stimulating, <laughs> some of them would, so stimulating as in cognitive challenges, some of them would then be quite free and creative uh, modules, so they had free choice of modules, and the last one would be a real sort of, again, de-stress or cool down or thank you, or, and so quite meditative. And um, what's part of the research, we've actually, rather than, most of us give kind of even now, even though we're so conscious, we still give a very teacher-centric class because we still structure it. Um, and I'm really keen to know what they like to do and how often they do that. So part of the research is which of these modules are they actually picking and doing? Um, they could, if they were being just very disciplined, string four or five together and make themselves an hour and a half class. But uh, I suggest that the, probably that they've not been doing that, but we're just getting in the research now. They've been filling in training books, bless them. Um, and uh, they're to say, you know, which were their, what, what are their preferences and what did they tend to do? So I'm hoping that that will feed back into the live practice as well of what would they actually like us to do more of rather than us just dictating and prescribing. So. David, do you want to speak to this? And also someone you know, someone we know named Joe has asked about um, the uh, question about retention. So if you could maybe just include that in your response, David, and let people know the magnitude of people that are attending your dance for PD in your, in your response, that'd be great. You're muted. Um, uh, how's that? You hear me now? Yeah. Um, one of the, one of the things I always talk about when I, as an ambassador for dance for Parkinson's in particular, is the synergy of movement and music, right? This connection that is, that starts to become more difficult uh, in people with Parkinson's who are often having more, more trouble finding an internal rhythm and need external cues of, of dance movement and music blended together to give them support. Now, we're taking that onto a platform where no matter how great your internet is, there's some latency. So movement and music are perhaps not connected. So how does that lay bare the challenges of, of, of what we're doing? And so one of the ways that I've really changed my teaching is to um, allow for that latency, even embrace that latency, encourage people to really listen to the music, whatever they are hearing, that's what they should be dancing to. And I am there to provide a physical guide, but they should not follow my movement to the beat. They should follow the music. And that's been a real, that's something I say every class, several times a class, because I really want them to be having their own internal experience, not trying to just mirror my, my movements. And so I've built um, the, at least the structured activities to have more repetition 
a, lo a longer chance with each section of that movement so that people can start to entrain to the music. They, they know what I'm doing. It's not a very complicated phrase to learn. And then they can enjoy it on their own without necessarily having to follow me. It's a bit like I use the um, comparison to a, uh, an orchestral conductor. Uh, she, may, she may look like she's conducting on the beat, but she actually has to conduct a little ahead of the beat for the orchestra to, to land on the beat. And so very hard to teach that way, but you can at least let acknowledge um, that there is latency and that people should really pick up what they can. I think the word acknowledge is also a really good, um, good word to keep in mind. I know Emily used that. We need to acknowledge that this is not a substitute for, nor is it a perfect simulation of a live class. And so there are opportunities there. There are opportunities to acknowledge the surroundings you're in. In many cases, usually I'm teaching from, from home, from my living room, and I can say, this is my living room. Welcome to my house. I'm happy to be teaching you. I can see all of your homes. I see, you know, and, and so there's, there's that, which doesn't normally happen in a class. I think acknowledging that, um, that there, there can be challenges to connect. So something that I've been working with is both being really close to the camera and also far away. I think when I started, I was like, I have to make sure that every part of my body is seen so that people know what's going on. And I started to feel very, I started to feel very isolated and kind of alienated from the group. So I've now, I've started to introduce more. There's some things that we do right at the camera where we're kind of sketching the frame of our Zoom. We're interacting. We're trying to do some touch actually through the screen, maybe even shaking hands. And then I'll move back to do some bigger, uh, bigger amplitude movements. Um, ensuring that we move away from, I think it's very easy, as Claire said, to, to get into a pattern of just kind of lead and follow teaching. Uh, really important to build in improvisatory elements, but particularly for Parkinson's, we need to make sure those elements are safe. Usually in a studio, we, I'm there, we have volunteers, we have assistants who can ensure that improvisatory activities where there's a lot of spontaneous decision-making and choice-making and co-creation, those can be supported and encouraged by uh, by physical assistance if needed. And at home, I can't do that. So I need to make sure that the improvisatory, spontaneously created activities that I'm facilitating um, have time for transitions, are led in a way where people have enough, uh, enough information to get into them and feel comfortable doing them, because again, we're not there in the space with them, and that they... Um, that they have a chance to really feel safe in all those activities. So I've had to restructure some of the improvisations, um, but I do try to, to include as much as I can in each class. Um, I also want to acknowledge one more thing, and then I'll, I'll, um, I'll sign off. Well, I guess the retention piece. So we have anywhere between six and 700 people um, signing into our classes each week, but we are offering classes every day. So we have dance six dance classes and then um, a Pilates for Parkinson's class, a yoga for Parkinson's class, and a singing class as well. Um, we also have meditation three times a week in the morning before class. So there's a lot going on. So that there, there are many opportunities to connect and to, to come into this space. Um, we find that people are coming back three, four, five times a week, which we don't normally see in our live classes. We have a couple of what I call frequent flyers people who come maybe to two or three class locations around New York City. And that's amazing because New York is not easy to get around. But in general, people come to the class that is closest to them. But now every class is close to them. It just takes, you know, a simple click of a switch and you're in. So, uh, so we are seeing not, not just retention, but a, a level of adherence and participation that we, we did not anticipate before, um, before the pandemic. And it's wonderful that we have people coming five, six times a week. It makes us think that we will, we will never go back to a situation where we're, we're only doing the studio classes. We will always have this, this um, streamed component. I also want to acknowledge one more thing. Um, there are 19 million Americans, that's 6% of the population, who do not have internet access. So we can spend many hours patting ourselves on the back for creating wonderful online programming. But we also want to acknowledge that there are a lot of people who don't have that privilege and don't have access. Um, we have been thinking a lot about this and uh, realizing that, that the combination of not being able to come to your regular class and not having internet compounds the isolation 
and sense of detachment that people feel. They are literally trapped at home without any, anything. Um, so we have started creating dance by phone classes where you can, uh, we have like an 800 number and you can call that number any time of the day or night. You dial an extension uh, and each extension has a different activity. And those activities are really, they're just prompts, they're verbal prompts. All, some of them are a little bit more structured, but really you can do whatever you want. Um, they're structured improvisations led by a voice and music um, that suggest things that you could think about and do. Um, some are, again, very specific, like a march. Uh, some are a painting activity that you can interpret however you wish. We have, yeah, you know, you're painting, you're in this style of splatter painting, you're smearing your living room, whatever it is. Um, we have about six or seven of those right now. We're building that up. Um, and uh, we've had a, a number of people calling, calling that number at all hours of the day or night to listen on their phones and to have that, that sense of connection. So I think as dance educators, we really have to think creatively about what we're doing, not just online, but thinking about the access issues that are inherent to our populations and make sure that we are, we have a responsibility to provide access to dance for, for everybody. And, um, and so that's something that, that has been a, a new thing. It's something we thought about in the past, but the pandemic really brought us right to that, to that edge of saying, there are people who are not in these classes and not able to get to these classes. What do we do? That's so awesome, David. <laughs> oh, it's say. the epitome of creativity in problem solving, right? Um, I, I don't know if you had something there to add, Claire, but I was just gonna say that I think something you just said, David, you said, you know, we were, we were thinking about this and the pandemic really pushed us there. And I think a lot of people are feeling that and this idea that we will not go back to just having studio classes. I mean, I, I am definitely seeing the value in continuing some element of this virtual teaching into the future. But for all of you who teach people for whom access, physical access is a, a real concern and a real um, consideration, I can imagine that um, this has really opened up some, some avenues for you. I wanted to also talk a little bit more about safety. So David started to talk about safety and we have talked in our first panel about safe dance practice during quarantine. So all of those issues apply to your populations, you know, check the floor around you, what's the space, making sure, you know, that people know how to safeguard themselves. But there are additional safety concerns um, that must come up for you given the vulnerability of the people you teach. So do you want to speak to how you've thought about those and how you're, you're working with that idea of being so physically removed from a population that has certain risks. Yeah, Claire, please. Um, I'll just unmute myself. So, I mean, my um, mixed senior populations, meaning you might have a little bit of many, many pathologies and physical conditions um, within, the, within the group. So that's, um, rather than, than taking care of a specific concern. So that's even a, a bigger differentiation, if you like, between what you're trying to look at. Um, obviously, uh, again, I've, I found it easier. No, that's wrong. Wrong word is easier. But I was able with the recorded material as opposed to the Zoom, so doing both. Uh, with the recorded material, I was able to speak much more about them going at their own pace and using the features of recorded. So in other words, put me on pause, stop and have water, um, rewind me and play that exercise again if I was going too fast. Or, so that, that sounds strange that there were advantages. There were advantages of recording for the seniors themselves. So many preferred to have me. <laughs> and then they like to do their movement at the time that's kind of convenient to them. And the um, idea of getting online at the same time as everybody else, although that was those that managed it or manage it, um, it there's big pluses because you see everybody else and we can speak to everybody else. But there's quite a stress around getting online and being ready to dance at 10 o'clock and, and feeling that it's an appropriate moment for you or something. So. Uh, although you might think that uh, videoing material and letting people download it is kind of more unsafe, it actually allowed them to not feel pressurized 
about the time that they did it or the space that they did it or how much they did or when they could stop or so there was um uh, that's not a great answer i mean we don't have an answer of you know of david has been through that we need contact information and if we're in a live zoom we're obviously trying to watch and respond but we can't respond in a way um that we could in a in a live studio where you can you can anticipate uh, a fainting or a low blood sugar or something like that you see it instantly in the you know the skin color or the um so we're most of us are uh, trained to know when this uh, uh high, not a hyper hypertension going on or um so that yeah obviously there's we don't have yet the answers to that kind of observation i would say i think we're we're not able to give guidelines here today we're really more just highlighting all the questions that there are around this um, the approach to this work, but obvious things like yeah, furniture and rugs and stops and having a seat and having waters and um, but there are so the, just suggesting that there are definite pluses to recording material and allowing people to go at their own pace if there's there's a there's a definite stress around a live session as well. That's all. <laughs> I might add as well um, that in delivery or during delivery, always trying to ensure that you have a colleague or at least another artist kind of on those Zoom sessions with you as a co-host um, or just another pair of eyes. So, you know, it's, it's too much to expect you to be able to see everyone and definitely through a screen, it's harder to make those observations and get that immediate feedback as to how people are moving and safely and whatnot. So trying to invite other people to join you in those sessions who you can check in with afterwards as to what did you notice, is there anyone we need to follow up on, etc. Um, and then also for me personally, I've set that everyone who joins has to complete a registration form before I will even offer them the Zoom links. And in that form, I take need to know information. Um, and importantly within that, uh, kind of any health considerations I need to be aware of and a disclaimer as to, you know, at no point should dance cause pain, dizziness, um, or shortness of breath and if they do you know this is what to do this is the protocol and also an emergency contact number if they're happy to share it to ensure that if there was a really serious issue we have someone else other than that participant to to contact and, and make them aware of, of what we've witnessed through the screen and just to follow up as to the health and well-being of that person. Um, I just want to briefly check in on what you said um, David about accessibility and this actually, for, A, you said something about uh, the potential development of online sessions. And for me, what I'm loving is the move dance field is no longer restricted by geographical location. Although it was born in London and we expanded across London, it's still London, it's still UK. When I'm in Bristol and it was London and Bristol. But now we've got women from, you know, very isolated rural areas in Cornwall in the southwest, from up north, even from parts of other parts of Europe. You know, anyone can dance and it's really wonderful to build a community where they're not limited by where they live. Having said that, obviously David's point about the not everyone has internet is a is a serious concern that you know making sure that as well as the online offer we're keeping in touch by email or people don't even have email, you know, via text message or phone calls, not quite as developed as <laughs> dancing by phone, but it's a great initiative. But something I've started to think about with a colleague is, you know, how can we um you know, potentially get funding to develop this and importantly within that funding strategy think about subsidizing costs for participants who want to get connected who don't have wi-fi or have wi-fi need a booster um, or could we partner with some kind of telecoms agency or just make them aware that you know this is available um, and it's necessary for people to keep physically creatively stimulated to their community of, of dancers but they've just got a technical equipment issue or, or internet issue and how can we speak out to the community beyond the dance sector and go, can you help us, you know, even taking £20 off a, 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 an internet phone bill or something to try and be the spokesperson for those people who might want to get connected. Do you, uh, yeah, do, do all of you feel like your roles as advocates have, have changed in that way? Do you share that feeling and also um, I'm going to feed a question from the, the audience in there also. Do your participants often have caregivers? So I guess both of those questions is having to do with like, are you finding yourself um, thinking more 
about your participants' whole community that serve them? You know, do you, or it, it, is that making sense, that question? <laughs> I, mean, I think yeah. it's just about volumes. You have to have an awareness of that to, to work with the people we work with. You know, what other support are they receiving or not? Um, for me, because the project Move Dance Fair was in partnership with cancer support organizations, you know, if something comes up that's kind of beyond the realms of the dance offering, I can signpost them to those centers. So maybe a one-on-one -on -one with a doctor or a counselor or um, nutrition advice, you know, it could be other things. So I think having awareness of that, but also Move Dance Fair was not only for women who have the cancer experience themselves, but also for their carers and family and supporters who are equally going through quite a difficult time. I don't know if that's the same with Dancer PD, David, that you welcome carers and supporters. Yes, we, we do. And that's been part of the program really from the beginning. Uh, however, it, not everybody used that opportunity uh, as, a, as a chance to dance. Some people would use that opportunity as a way to get errands done. You know, while their, their partner was in class, they would have an, an hour and a half to go do something else. Uh, we've seen a big change in that, obviously, because now everyone's home together and now everyone's dancing together. So we've seen probably an increase in the number of partners who are participating um, with their loved ones. And that's that's been it's been wonderful. I think one of the things that you're touching on here is a really important challenge, perhaps, which is that in many cases, individual dance artists and dance organizations have become social service organizations or social service coordinators in this pandemic, just by virtue of the fact that we really are connected with our participants and we really care about them. And so we want to make sure that we're, that we can fill that role informally. I don't think any of us are taking that role on formally. We're not trained to do that, but that we are making sure that we're staying attuned to broader needs aside from just the need to dance and the need to be part of an artistic community and so you know within the first week or two we started calling our our participants uh, at home just to check in with them just to say how are you doing what what do you need uh, a lot of the things they needed we couldn't provide but we could provide links to people who could help them say I'm scared to go to the grocery store. Is there any service that can provide that for me? Or um, I really need to pick up my medication, but I don't know what to do. Those kinds of issues. And so, again, we're not providing those direct services, but we can say, oh, we know somebody who is delivering food in your neighborhood. Here's who that is. Or there's, you can, have you thought about um, this prescription service where they just deliver it to your home? Like that kind of, that kind of resource support. So I think we, we do want to walk that line because I think, I think um, as, as dancers, we do feel a sense of social responsibility. We've taken on these, uh, these teaching uh, responsibilities with passion because we love sharing dance with a wide uh, spectrum of, of individuals. And part of that is ensuring um, well-being for, that, goes beyond the, that goes beyond the dance experience. So it's been, I, I love the idea of you know, looking at this partly as a, as a technological challenge and, and looking at funding opportunities that can help um, purchase or share that technology with people who don't have it. Because we know that dance is a lifeline. We know that it's a critical component of people's care and well-being. And so the thing that's keeping people from that care is, you know, a, an inexpensive tablet or, or a phone that allows them to actually participate in these programs. And that is a very tangible thing that I think funders, pharmaceutical companies, health insurers could potentially get behind. Um, the other thing I, I want to just mention going back to sort of the in-class safety is we've really tried to match the, uh, the access offerings that we have in our live classes on Zoom. So just as in our live classes, we have some part of the class that is done seated and some part of the class that is optionally standing. Even when I, as the facilitator, am standing, we always have uh, a member of our team showing a seated version. So we actually take time out. And this has actually been the biggest technical challenge for our participants because in the middle of class, I have to say in the next activity, we're going to make our way out of the chair. I usually do that as a dance. Um, but if you are more comfortable staying seated, I'm going to introduce you to Amy. And Amy is one of our colleagues, amazing uh, partner who is is going to be showing the seated portion of the class and let's just take a moment if you if you want to follow Amy 
to pin Amy in your screen. So we give people a chance to come back to their computer, computers, find that pin command, right? You see everybody going like this, and they will pin Amy's screen so that they can follow her instead of me. And that is just, I think it's, I think it's really important, particularly for a population where standing can be, um, can be quite, quite dangerous. It's not, uh, there are a whole range of issues here, um, but for a while in New York City, people really did not want to go to the hospital if you didn't have to go. And so it wasn't just that we care very deeply about everyone's safety. It was, it was that even if something did happen, you didn't want to, you didn't want to go to the ER. Like you just didn't want to go. That hospitals were basically COVID only, right? So that was, that was a huge factor. And so very early on, we did introduce this. We were a little nervous about it because uh, again, we're, many of our participants had never been on Zoom before. They didn't know sort of the ins and outs of changing who you're pinning and spotlighting and all that stuff. Um, but they're, they're good with it now and they're very used to it. And we always have 15 minutes before class where people come on and we kind of talk them through any technical issues, including how to pin so that they always have, um, have a, a demonstrator who is, who is working with them at a level they're comfortable at. Let, uh, I want to um, hang on one second, Claire, because yeah. I just want to keep an eye on the time. Mm -hmm. So let me introduce an idea and you can maybe merge your comment with this. Um, there's a couple things that I'm hearing coming up in terms of um, both the support that you're offering in terms of having an, you know, a team member who's doing it seated. And so there's a lot of people involved. You've spoken about, you know, really engaging so deeply and caring so much about your participants. And we know that, you know, people who care that much, it, we'll, we're willing to give and give and give, but there are these logistics of like paying the rent, you know? So, so Sue has asked um, about money and whether you're charging. And I, you know, it's interesting because we're all, some of you are from more socialist uh, European systems and we're in this very capitalist. So, so we're in very different types of structures of economies. Um, so I'd like to talk more in a little bit about the technology and how your dancers are managing technology. But if you could also maybe just speak to some of these, like how are you managing the financial reality and are people paying for class through this? Yeah, Claire. I mean, I'm speaking then obviously from a very, let's say privileged situation in Switzerland here um, in that well, for lots of reasons, we're not suffering the same either the same COVID level of, of um, pandemic here, um, but also not the civil unrest either. So I do apologize that this is, this is sounding rather privileged. Um, but we, the, the first part of the description that I've given from March, we've been working with a subsidy from a research grant. Um, so we've been able to provide what we've been providing as, as under the umbrella of research. However, we, I just learned this week that we won't go back to live classes. So that I'm talking about the autonomous seniors now who come into the theater and work with the professional dancers as well and work in all of that environment, which is, um, gives them a very three-dimensional or holistic in the true sense of it, experience of, of working theater, professional dance, music, et cetera. And they are working as in David's project as well. They're working in the real ballet studios. So we will not be going back live until 2021. That's the requirements here in Switzerland for that um, population over 65. Um, so immediately working with the theater, the Bern Ballet Concert Theater Bern on how to, I'm gonna take this into creativity. So to answer Sue's question, yes, that's then paying. So they're paying for that project which is then self-supporting, even with, to, with a support teacher as well. Um, that's how we work live, that the projects support themselves financially from the registration. Um, and we will probably charge less on Zoom. We're also ourselves not traveling or don't have quite as many expenses as we would do if we were live in studios. However, where I want to take this is actually trying to use the positive aspects of the medium. So being stuck at home and feeling so isolated, we still want to be able to take them into rehearsal and to take them into the theater environment or me actually take them and, and teach from the theater environment so that they're feeling that they're doing a guided tour or a virtual tour at the same time. 
And one of the things that we will be doing is actually having the professional dancer wear the camera so that they can experience the choreography that they will then be later working on with me, or at least we'll be um, improvising or basing our own explorations around the theme of the repertoire. So that's how we structure our programs, but trying to give them that sense that they're there and that they're inside the rehearsal with the professional dancer. So that's really now just now that we know that this next project is virtual and not live. And um, we just start to work with the theater about how best to do and make that a real experience, even though you're at home. Um, Emily, I know you have to leave soon, so I want to give you a chance to chime in. No, you're okay to stay? You're good to stay on? Okay. Um, so Emily or David, do either of you want to also contribute to that component of the... I would, yeah, I wouldn't mind just adding. Um, I, I'm offering the sessions for free, and this is to kind of stay true to the ethos of Mood Dance Field, the, 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 dance, the live dance sessions in uh, partnership with the cancer support centers are free and this is also because people who are often experiencing cancer are out of work they don't have a steady income stream um, and that might be for months if not years however I do run a pay by donation scheme so whereas most of the work I, I fundraise for and that funds the live sessions obviously this idea of being online is so new although I'm trying to get it um, off the ground with some fundraising, you know, at the moment I've just been following it, offering it voluntarily with a donation scheme. And I think initially for me, I was okay with that because it was a bit of an experiment. Um, and I had a very strong kind of pastoral connection with the women I've been dancing with for four years. But at the same time, when people really value what you're offering, they, they will give. And whether that's two pounds from some people, 20 pounds from others or 30 pounds from others, um, if you have a, an open space in which to do that. And online, there's lots of things you can do to set that up, whether that's a Just Giving page or a crowdfunder, etc. cetera. Um, that said, I think for those freelancers that don't have a team and don't have any prior experience of fundraising, it can be a challenge. Um, so just start slowly. Um, the Zoom account for 40 minutes, you can do free sessions. So hopefully the costs are still low for you. Um, and it's not kind of, how many people you know, it's who you know, what they can do. So beg, borrow and steal <laughs> as much as possible just to um, get yourself off the ground with those sessions if it's of interest, but don't tie yourself into anything until you know it might be working for you. And you, you might be surprised by how much people will give if you don't necessarily set uh, an amount from the off start, if that makes sense. You're muted, David, sorry. <laughs> I, I would echo that entirely. We're, we're using a similar model where the classes are, all of the classes are offered free of charge. Um, we do certainly let people know that they're welcome and encouraged to contribute um, at any level. And we welcome contributions of any level. Uh, we, we've been really um, encouraged by the, uh, the level of support that the Dance for Parkinson's community has, has given in response to the classes. Uh, the thing I like about that model is that it allows, that, that again, people can participate nine classes a week, no, no charge, no expectation, you are welcome. Um, those people who are able to give can and do give um, and give regularly. So they have, for, for some individuals, they've turned it into for themselves, a something of a fee. So they, they say, I'm gonna set a rate and it's gonna be whatever, $25 a week for my four classes and so every week they will make a donation based on that amount that is not necessarily something that we um set but we do encourage them to think about this as a as a valuable service and it is i think as emily said for those of you who are starting out um don't necessarily commit yourself to a schedule before you know a that this can work and b that your community is is buying into it but my i can't guarantee it but my sense is that these this kind of dance for health programming does provide a much needed valuable lifeline for people during this time. And I think what this crisis has brought about is that it's not just now, but always. There are, there are people who, um, who would love to participate in your program who may live on the other side of the country, who may not, that time doesn't work for them. And they are so grateful now to be able to come into your program. And Emily's seeing this from people coming in from Cornwall and, and other places in the, in the UK that ordinarily would not be able to participate. Now you've suddenly gone national 
more than that, that's sort of like the promotional aspect, but more than that, it's that there are more people who can benefit by what you're, by what you're doing um, without a huge lift in, in, in infrastructure. And I think for independent dance artists, that's a, that's a really co compelling uh, structure for, for moving forward, that you, are now, you now have an audience that is, is as big as you want to make it, and, and that, that just have to do it sustainably. Just have one um, Emily and then Claire and then I'll go on, but yeah. Something that's been fed back that was like, oh, such a good point. It takes a confident person to walk into a dance space or a space where dance is offered and know that they're going to take part in dancing and all that nervousness, insecurity about the body, et cetera, plays a part. Whereas online, from the comfort of their own home, knowing that they can join, it's four or five minutes or an hour, you know, it's not huge, but they haven't had to travel to get there. It's a much more appealing offer. And people, I think, feel safer. I just something to think about if you're pursuing setting up dance sessions, how you talk about it, how you advertise it in a way that's perhaps less intimidating. We, we have another consideration in Parkinson's. There, there are a number of people who are not out about their Parkinson's and have specifically said, I, I'm, I'm not coming to a live class because my employers don't know that I have Parkinson's and I don't want anyone to know. On Zoom, you can just turn off your video and change your name and nobody will even know it's you, right? So, you know, it does, uh, it does offer an element of privacy that I think is, is really, it can be very attractive to people. Sorry, Claire. No, no, no problem. Those are very, very good points indeed. I was going to give, um, wearing a completely other hat, I was going to give a kind of um, both commercial and slightly more business angle to all of this as well, which is that um, health insurers, global health insurers and health insurers are incredibly interested that we develop this model and that we get out to isolated people or uh, work with patient groups and find the the way that they can actually support this. So this is, this is, they are in many circumstances proactively looking for us to be able to deliver successfully uh, good quality online, um, not instead of our live work, but as well as our live work to, to reach housebound um, people, to reach uh, those that, as Emily and David have so well said, simply don't want to be um, recognized or acknowledged. And this doesn't have to be um, the senior population. This is there are plenty of um, people who are not moving in other segments of our population. And I just wanted to put in the minds of, of teaching artists and uh, those of us that are developing this sector, the question of the real relationship versus the virtual relationship. Um, and those are the kind of conversations I've been having already with healthcare providers, um, insurers, is, is that real relationship necessary? And is it a ratio between do, do you need to make a real contact uh, which then gives a problem geographically. Do you need to have a real contact? And then there can be a follow-up with, let's say, a ratio of four virtuals to one real. Um, and that's an area, in fact, probably that we're going to look at researching next at, at Bern University at the, the Sports Science Institute of what is that ratio between live connection for most value um, out of that. But so that's, that's, really an area for um, teaching artists and dance educators, please, please to start thinking about. Because if we don't do it, um, somebody else will of a lesser ability or a lesser skills level. And, um, you know, I beg you to think about it, even though it's not perhaps the ideal solution. And we understand that the live is a thousand times uh, more enriching and uh, satisfactory to provide. But, so that's my plea. <laughs> yeah, I think that this situation is so two-sided. Um, yeah, we don't want to make ourselves extinct. We don't want anyone to get the impression that our jobs can be automized, automatized or something, you know? Um, we certainly as artists and performers believe in this real human thing. Um, so we have to preserve that, but also, yeah, we don't want to deny that there's something really phenomenal that happens here. And we also, as David said, can't ignore the fact that not everybody has, while it enhances access for some, it decreases access for others. And um, I mean, I'm thinking 
also about how right now we have dance for PD or we have like dance for seniors and I teach a younger population of you know college students and we are inaccessible to a lot of people <laughs> in a college setting either for financial reasons or mental health reasons or chronic illness. I mean, there are so many chronic illness. There are so many things that can prevent a student from being a dance major in a college setting. And so wouldn't, do you see any potential for this online platform to enable more integration of these worlds of dance so that it is no longer this like dance for PT or dance, for, you know, while there might be specializations because there are special needs in each of those groups, that like somehow we could use technology to level the playing field a little bit more while acknowledging that not everyone has the same technological access. <laughs> Any thoughts about that? <laughs> uh oh. Nobody going for it. Well, well I mean, I, 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 question. Is it, so you're asking whether. I'm hearing a boundary breaking situation, but are you thinking about bringing participants together from different groups? So it's only educators, dance for health, performers? I mean, I just think that I'm not sure. That's why I'm, I'm, I guess my question is, what do you see for the future from all that we've done and how far can you sort of stretch that imagination for the future in terms of how we can use this platform? <laughs> I'll start off. Um, I mean, I think it's, uh, as we've already spoken about that, all of us, but I think it, it's possibly a great entry into dance. So if you're talking about mental health uh, challenges, which can be for any age group in the population from teenage through to, um, no, not just a, a, an older population. Um, that the, the, the advantages there of the anonymity or the try something and don't feel so necessarily engaged or on the spot um, I have huge advantages. I've also spoken about doing work with dance for um, obesity sufferers for the same reasons, all the reasons that Emily mentioned as well, that you would never, you, do, you just don't want to go to a studio. And so how can you start? So I think that there's, um, there's definite possibilities and advantages to using virtual with certain groups um, or for certain groups that doesn't get into your how do you how do you melt meld everybody together but I also could imagine an, a scenario where you're teaching both live and streamed at the same time um, for different uh, choices literally that one could have a choice that one could participate from another geographical region um, and have that possibility because we're all getting a bit better with the technology and at the same time also be dealing with a, with a live group. So I think there, there'll be um, hybrid, hybrid uh, solutions like that we'll be seeing a lot more. It's the same in conferences. We're going to see that in conferences a lot more where it's about 50-50 uh, simultaneously. Um, I think we'll possibly see that in dance as well. I think one of the, one area just to build on Claire's excellent comments is the way that both independent artists and uh, dance companies will think about creating artistic material that is uh, really not only to be viewed or consumed in the theater, but actually in the home and then building engagement activities around whatever that material is for a variety of populations. And I would, I'm probably the first to say that I think um, teaching specialization is is critical here, that it, it takes different uh, approaches and methods to teach different populations. However, we can all start from the same core material. And we we have seen some organizations have that online material ready to go and have shared it very generously. Others are a little bit behind. They have only really been thinking about a live theater mindset and don't have those resources. And I think this crisis is forcing everybody, whether you're an independent choreographer, whether you're a large company, um, to think about making those resources available to people who don't go to the theater, making them available in the home, making them available for, for co consumption in the living room. And then from that, as I said, building, building educational uh, programming from that for a, a different, different populations. But having a one single source, uh, uh, whether that's videos of performance, whether that's the dancers talking about their process, um, that can then be worked into 
um, the, the, this virtual teaching model. And one thing that we tried last week was we taught some movement from a piece of Mark Morris's and one of the participants said, I really like learning it. It'd be really helpful to see it. So the next week we actually, you know, stopped the, or didn't stop the Zoom call, but in the middle I came over and I said, okay, I'm gonna show you a one minute clip from this film. And we showed them a little section of Grand Duo and everybody watched it. That's that's what we're working on. And I think there was a real sense of pride. That, you know, we, we have that anyway. We use rep all the time. But just to um, just to be able to see it is something that we don't normally do in the studio. It's harder to say, okay, everybody just sit and we're gonna watch this video. Could do that. But on, on Zoom, it's so much easier. So I think there's there's much more opportunity for that kind of really um, kind of engaged and interactive learning. I, I wanna say that Karen in the audience also brought a point up. She's a professional dancer and teacher who's on dialysis. And so this opportunity, this Zoom situation has enabled her to be a teacher again. You know, so it's not, it, it, we're talking a lot about um, participants in dance class, but that's sort of what I, I'm thinking about. Like how far can we stretch this and who all can benefit, like how can we get it uh, around as many people as possible? Um, so I just thank you, Karen. That's so important to hear from you. Emily, yeah. A beautiful segue into something I wanted to raise. Um, something I've been witnessing over the last few months is the amount of dance organizations reaching out to the artists, offering kind of artist surgeries, you know, and especially I think within the dance and health context, it's been a on my radar for the last two years that the excitement around dance for health work or dance for health initiatives is great, but the support structures for the artists, especially freelance, have not been monitored or <laughs> supported as well as the offerings for the participants and benefits. So I think personally, um, I'm meeting up with my artists on Zoom much more regularly than we were um, having very busy lives and busy schedules, you know, across different places in the UK. So I think that's a benefit. And I think people's awareness um, has hopefully turned a bit as to how we're supporting the artists to deliver the work, especially if the artists are isolated, delivering the work from their homes um, and actually holding what they were saying, you know, 100 participants at once, if not more, in my group, almost 70. So, you know, making sure that we still have those check-in and support structures and um, that's actually just as effective, I'm finding, online. Um, as it would have been perhaps sharing the same space with people. Although, you know, those access to studios that we just want to physically condition ourselves as well are obviously a consideration. Alice, just a quick other point, because I was thinking today, I uh, was looking at the wonderful um, American company, Axis Dance Company, which is an inclusive uh, dance company that engages those with disabilities uh, as well as able-bodied, but particularly choreographers and, um, and teachers. And I was thinking just as we were speaking there that the, the Zoom possibility actually increases possibilities for teachers with movement challenges or, or disability or, or mobility challenges, um, making that you know, much easier, not as David would say, not having to get across New York or get across um, Oakland, California to get to your classes to teach them. But the, the must, that must be a medium that can actually help the inclusivity, not just of our participants, but actually of uh, teaching artists and choreographers. Especially when we include asynchronous learning in that, because, you know, people with chronic illnesses may not be able to teach every day at two o'clock that just maybe one day they're not feeling it. You know, they can't get out of bed that day. So the ability to record when you're able, when you feel the capacity and then put that out in an asynchronous format so that people can upload it from YouTube or whatever, whenever they want to join. So. Such a great point, yeah. Um, should we, just in the closing, as we move towards the end here, we, we could still talk a little bit more about technology. Um, somebody in the comments was asking just about like, you know, managing 100 people, the Zoom, the login, the security, the <laughs> passwords. And, um, you know, for some of your participants, maybe they haven't, maybe they don't have a lot of technology literacy. It might be new to them, but others actually might have been using technology for quite a long time to support them 
um, as technology has been so helpful in helping, um, so helpful in serving people uh, who have a variety of needs. So do you wanna just um, give some anecdotes or paint some pictures of how your participants have been navigating the, tech, the real technological component of everything? David? Oh, very, very briefly. I think the key was really providing time to orient people on Zoom. Uh, at the very beginning, we would allow up to half an hour just to talk people through before class, make sure everybody knew how to use it, what was going on, and, and troubleshoot. Uh, now it's down to about 10 to 15 minutes before class where, um, where we come on and provide that support. I think it's really important, uh, and, and Emily said this, this earlier, but don't be the only person in that Zoom room, right, who's, who's facilitating. In our programs, we have obviously a teaching partner who can show seated options, but also we have a, a, an MC, somebody who's really the host of that call, so that that responsibility does not necessarily fall only on the teaching artist. I think that person can assist with technical things during the call. And that's one of the key things that you that you really want. Um, if you're trying to teach and troubleshoot on Zoom in terms of technical things, I can't see you, I can't hear you. Yeah. Um, it, it gets it gets really distracting. So um, technical things that come up, we most of our participants are using chat to to speak with uh, Natasha or Maria or my colleagues, and they're able to provide technical support um, through that. In terms of registration, what we have done is we, we've set up um, registration on a, a particular platform. As soon as somebody clicks submit, it automatically kicks them into Zoom. So we are not providing publicly Zoom links and passwords. Uh, we are making people register. They can't register more than 15 minutes before class because it will send them into nothing, right? It only sends them to the active link on Zoom. And so once they register, they're, they're in there. Uh, we've had a couple instances of people who have not been able to, to get in for whatever reason, and we can follow up with them later in the week and talk them through. But that that has worked pretty well, and it's also enabled us to to maintain um, uh, control over who is who is getting those links and how how that process happens. And then obviously the MC can monitor things during the call, make sure nobody is coming in who shouldn't be there, um, and and obviously providing support to people who need assistance. We had just speaking about the recorded again rather than the zooms. We had um, a, a logically number of challenges at the beginning with things like we transfers. We we tried everything. Now we tried putting them as Vimeo links, which is a, a inevitably much simpler for uh, our population to actually click on a link and, and go to it. Um, but we also tried the um, WeTransfer and that was uh, quite new territory for many of them. And also you get back to the hardware question, which is many of them actually had simply two old uh, home PCs uh, to be able to, first of all, the downloading process was just so long and so challenging, but also actually storage ability to, so we had to find ways to compress and reduce um, megabytes of material that we were giving so that they could actually cope and, and get them. But we did all that then by email communication. We were, had a lot, a lot of um, uh, communication going on about how to do that. And, and they're, they're pretty good actually with each other. So there's a real support network between them. So it's, it's amazing, even within the same age group, uh, which ones are really techie savvy. And which ones are, you know, wouldn't know one side of an iPhone from the other. Um, but they, they're really been, rather than asking, have really been helping each other a lot as well. But um, that's, that's not as, uh, that's the, the recorded um, considerations, of course. Yeah, that, I agree. It's been wonderful in the Zoom sessions hearing, you know, the an octogenarian uh, giving tech support to the septuagenarian and giving them say, no, 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 don't do that. You have to press this. And so it's like, like we, we're sitting by watching that peer to peer mentoring. I love that. I would just add to say, yeah, yeah, exactly. similar that kind of peer to peer learning and also that some might need a little bit more prep a little bit more communication at the beginning but others um just got on with it but i work with women from you know it's kind of 18 plus so in their 20s 30s 40s as well as 70s and 80s but something i've also found is that even if they're fearful and they name that they're fearful they're so desperate to want to dance <laughs> that they kind of just overcome that a lot of people and they might be online going oh i don't know how this works mm -hmm. and i don't know how to chat I'm like but you've made it on zoom we can see you we can hear you <laughs> like, let's dance and just about Know, after week two weeks three weeks four weeks they get more comfortable with that so if they're if they're able to get over their fear and just 
click the link and join, they might then find that it's easier than um, they perhaps felt in their imagination. And there was one more thing I just wanted to drop in. An artist, uh, Tom Hobden, who's based in the UK, gave me a brilliant suggestion that I haven't tried yet. He said, if you make a, a five, 10 minute tutorial recorded on whatever platform you're using as to how to use it, and anyone who registers your sessions, you could just send that in. It's a lot more personable coming from you. They get to know you in some way and you're showing them how to use it visually rather than written instructions. Really brilliant idea for anyone who might want to try it. I have to just add there that the eldest member of one of some of my programs, so the ni a 90 year old student, is the one that runs the online chat help for all the others. So she's providing not, not only technological help, but actually also, you know, then mental health and other um, confinement and isolation challenges. But, you know, as, as Emily said, where there's a will, there's a way, and um, they're incredibly resourceful. I mean, I don't think we should be patronizing at all. We, of course, we need to help, but actually our communities are um, incredibly resourceful and I uh, take my hat off to them that they are, they are dancing. <laughs> Well, I think that's a, a great segue into um, sort of some closing remarks that um, you all have certainly illuminated for anyone who did not know the power of um, dance to heal. So thank you for sharing that. And also, um, Karen, again, is just saying like reinforcing and, and has made a plea that we all, not just the panelists, but all of us, um, think about these different populations and continue this online platform. So for, for the panelists, many of you, Claire has already said that she knows some of her group will not be in person at least until um, 2021. And I'm sure many of your populations will again remain virtual for a long time. So just do you want to share, go around maybe and just share a closing idea of how you're um, feeling moving forward and just sort of where you're at uh, overall in conclusion. Claire, do you want to start? Yeah. Uh, of course I can start. Well, I mean, a huge disappointment that they can't come back live um, before 2021. That was my first uh, reaction and of course will be theirs. They don't yet know it, unfortunately. Um, the, well, they maybe do if they're listening to this now. <laughs> uh, so just jumping straight in as once I got over that, you know, sense of oh, barrier that we were going to still be on virtual. I'm really feeling now more inspired to jump into the creative aspect of it and say, okay, it's not ideal. It's not the first choice, but what can this medium do? So I, I kind of touched on that already, but really using the theater and using the professional dancers and the choreographers and seeing how we can make the medium come alive rather than thinking of ourselves in this kind of pros arch where we just record a class or something. How really can we use filming much more like a filmmaker rather than as a, uh, you know, dance teacher recording their class. So that's, I'm just, I got to the point over the disappointment and into that, right, let's embrace this like a choreographer or something and let's see how we can make this project really exciting for them. And like David, our, ours are always based around repertoire. So I have a theme, um, you know, we can go in and see material in process, etc. So it can make it a really, um, three-dimensional, if that's a good description of it, um, stimulation. So lots of different learning opportunities, not just movement learning opportunities. Yeah, Emily, you wanna go ahead? Thanks. Um, yeah, I think I'm still really itching to be in a live space with people. I think we all have a real want to to share the, the same environment and go back to that that round, in the round 3, 3G, 360 view. But at the same time, as David said, I think we've all said, there is a real excitement around what the possibilities are for doing both um, and how you can really strengthen your offer in a kind of a virtual and a, and a, live, a live offering. And I think personally, I'm really excited by the creative challenges that teaching online is, is offering me um, and just adding new dimensions to the work in this field overall. I mean, a dance film discussion group, how we bounce off that with creative ideas, um, you know, I'm someone who always used to really travel a lot in my dance practice and launch myself across the space. So how can I still get the same level of satisfaction for me and my participants in a, in a confined space? It's forcing you to think in new ways, to find different ways of moving. 
Um, so I'm excited to keep exploring it. That said, we need some money. So if funders could get on board, please do. And that's actually a really important point for anyone who's um, thinking of diving into this. Do not devalue what you're offering online. Um, if anyone wants to commission you for offering online sessions, you know, charge the rates you would in a normal session because it's still time, energy, administration, prep. Um, yeah, try and give yourself a monetary value that's in equal weight. Thank you, Emily. Uh, David. That's a great point. I think we've tended to pr privilege the live experience to the, the online experience. It's the same amount of work and planning and effort that has to go in. It may, as Claire said, it may even be harder to teach online. In fact, I can say there are certain days when it feels a lot harder uh, than, than the live experience. So make sure that you are valuing that and, and advocating for yourself in that context. Um, I echo what you both said. I think, you know, now that we've kind of, we've gotten through that initial uh, comfort period, orientation period. How does this all work? How can we just sustain regular classes or, or activities? Now we're going to be asking ourselves, what more can we do? So could we do a performance project? Could we bring in more uh, repertory and, and do workshops um, based on that? Can we have, I think for particularly in terms of our um, our teaching pool, we had, because of how um, some of the, the staff furloughs worked here. Um, there are certain people that we weren't able to work with for a while. Now we're bringing them back. And uh, some of those teachers represent backgrounds and styles that, that diversify our, our, our um, teaching approach, bring in different styles, including uh, West African dance, flamenco, um, hula, so different bringing in, really recognizing the diversity of dance styles that are out there that our participants love to do, but we haven't been able to really explore while we've been getting our our, our feet wet in this this whole new terrain. So we're really looking at, you know, and, and asking questions about how can we, as Claire said, how can we emphasize that the creative components of this? So it's, yes, we're working on daily class, but also having something that we're working towards as perhaps a project, whether that's going to be a film or a performance, or something where people have um, even more creative ownership and participation in, in something that we create together. And that's, those are the questions that I'm I'm asking. We're also uh, really, because of the reach of this platform, thinking about some of the uh, language access issues that we have. And so um, we committed ourselves to doing six classes in Spanish um, through the end of this month. And we have been offering that in partnership with the Muhammad Ali Parkinson Center in Arizona. Um, and that has been very, very successful. We had, I think, more, more than 100 people tuning into those calls. Uh, and, and because of the large Spanish speaking population in the US, we will be working on that more. But we also know there are other populations uh, who have traditionally perhaps not um, come on board into our program because of language barriers. Um, and we, because of this technology, uh, whether that's a live class that is um, uh, has instantaneous um, interpretation or is a pre-recorded class that we could do either a voiceover or um, or subtitles. We're really thinking about that now and, and using this medium where it's a bit more difficult in a live class, it really slows things down, but in film you can actually do that in, in real time and it's, uh, it's a wonderful experience. So again, we want to we want to explore those opportunities and hopefully uh, funders will be on board for that and, and understand the value of Yes, we talk about dance as a universal language, but it is so much more accessible when it's in your language. Yeah. That's a great, great tip, David. Thank you, because I often have to deliver trilingually. So well, yes, certainly... you live in Switzerland. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I del deliver a class in three languages anyway, but that does certainly slow things down. And I am um, just, you know, jump between the languages. I don't tend to repeat everything all the time, but jump between the languages in the hope that everybody else has a notion of the other language. Um, but yeah, that, that is an added cognitive challenge as a, as a teacher. <laughs> but so I might go for the subtitle <laughs> version. That sounds good. I just can't thank all of you enough, really, for your time and the devotion to the work that you do. And I think you've just been so inspiring um, to so many people and to be reminded of the creative potential and the reach potential in this situation, which is often very uncomfortable and not ideal and not what we had all hoped for. It's 
such a gift to remind us that there is so much potential in it. So thank you all so much. And Osa, thank you so much for, she has been so busy in the chat, you guys. She's been like putting so many links up and answering questions and sharing um, resources. So thank you all so yeah. much and um, reach out to us anytime. Take care, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank, thank you, you so Ellie. Much. And thank you also.